But the, but the vision for peace had, had the territorial dimensions, which were new, okay, which gave the Palestinians a significant amount of incremental territory. Now, would they have a state in a traditional sense? No. Ambassador David Friedman, thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thanks, Ellie. It's really great to be with you. It's wonderful to have you. Ambassador, um, I think everyone, whether they love you or I guess perhaps not, has, um, has you pegged as one of the most consequential envoys that the United States has ever had, including even the New York Times, which I think is not uh, on necessarily on the love side of the ledger. The reason is that you um, were one of the leading forces, if not the leading force, for so much of the foreign policy of the Trump administration that the administration is hailed for, whether it's the move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, the recognition of the Golan Heights as under Israeli sovereignty. And incredibly, you were controversial from day one, from the minute that President Trump announced that he wanted to nominate you as ambassador of the United States to Israel through the confirmation process and into office. In fact, um, five previous ambassadors of the United States to Israel even wrote a letter during your confirmation process uh, urging members of Congress that you were somehow unqualified for this position. And the media also was, I would say, rather unfair to you even uh, during the time that you were in the administration. What's your takeaway in dealing with the media and, and all the naysayers on, uh, on the Trump administration's various out-of-the-box choices? Well, look, you know, um, I think the first thing I'd say is, you know, all's well that ends well, and it all ended really well. I think most people who were critical at the beginning have since uh, modulated their views because of the uh, accomplishments we had within the administration. Look, um, I was disappointed in the reaction uh, by the uh, by Democratic uh, legislators, by by left wing media, not because they weren't entitled to have their views of uh, what was best for the U.S. Israel relationship. They were, but um, you know, in the in the history of the uh, of the state of Israel, uh, there's never been a contested uh, ambassadorial appointment to the state of Israel. Now, many of those people were were you know, far to the left. I mean, I'll give you an example. My predecessor, Dan Shapiro, good guy, very well schooled in the uh, subject matter, uh, but, but his views could not be more different than mine on, on important issues. Now, when he was up for nomination, uh, I think it was a voice vote like 90-something to zero because the Republican Party never thought for a second that they would inject that kind of level of partisanship into this issue. And they recognized that the president was entitled to his choice. Now, I was not given that courtesy, and it bothered me because, uh, on the one hand, I'm being lectured by um, by members of the uh, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on the importance of bipartisanship, but their refusal, their refusal to allow President Trump to select an ambassador whose views are in accord with his, they couldn't accept. So where's the bipartisanship? So uh, I don't like what I saw, but um, but as they say, you know. Um, I think one of the senators said to me, look, whether you get 100 votes or you get 51 votes, you know, you got the same job. And uh, thank God I was able to uh, move forward in the position. Indeed. And, uh, and some of the accomplishments that you have under your belt in the four years of the administration, I would say, are historic. And uh, there aren't many ambassadors to any country that could could uh, loud the kind of accomplishments that you have. Ambassador, as we speak, your new book, Sledgehammer, which we have right here, um, is going to be made available to the public. And I read the book in advance of our conversation, and I felt that the most it was one of the most truthful tellings of what actually took place in the administration that has been published to date. Mm -hmm. In the book, you say, um, quote, Sledgehammer is a book about what happens when the United States stops listening to the diplomatic elite and challenges the parties to look past the grievances of their grandparents in favor of the opportunities available to their grandchildren. What do you mean by that? Well, look, the uh, U.S.-Israel policy for a couple of generations uh, was, was broken. I mean, it was just completely broken. Uh, I, I think I used the, the expression, it was like a, a broken bone that had not set properly and you sort of needed to break it and reset it to get it back on track. There was, there was nothing to point to, uh, to build upon. 
you know, the, the relationship between Israel and its neighbors had gone nowhere since, uh, I guess, the most recent peace agreement was between Israel and Jordan in 1994. Before that, there was one other with Egypt in 1978. Nothing, nothing had happened since then. There, was, there were some Maslow Accords in the uh, early 90s that were essentially observed in the breach. I mean, they, they really didn't go anywhere. And, you know, and for years and years and years, um, everyone was saying that you couldn't do anything in the region. You couldn't make any moves forward without the consent of the Palestinians. So, you know, you had given the Palestinians a veto on, on all progress. Um, and then what are the Palestinians? The Palestinians are either the PA, which is highly corrupt um, and ineffective, or Hamas, which is brutal and, uh, uh, and a terrorist organization. So you're, you're allowing the policies of the United States and the rest of the world vis-a-vis -vis Israel to be driven and to be controlled by, you know, two entities neither of which have any credibility to be in that role. And so we had to break it. We, we needed, literally needed a sledgehammer to break it. And, um, and, and I thought that the whole key to this was to stop looking at ancient grievances and start looking at forward opportunities. And as we did that, you know, that's where the Abraham Accords began to, to come to life. And I want to talk about the Abraham Accords, but before we get to that, mm -hmm. the, one of the most historic events under your ambassadorship was the move of the embassy. In the book, you describe the moment when uh, you and uh, the most senior cabinet members are in the West Wing um, talking to President Trump. And in that moment, you are trying to convince him when there are multiple voices that are uh, arguing the opposite. And you're trying to convince President Trump that this decision to move the embassy to Jerusalem is going to be almost like the pivotal decision for him in terms of giving the message to all the bad guys of what the United States stands for. What, what was like that moment like for you and for the room? It was an extraordinary moment. Um, the, uh, the, the, the weight that I felt, the responsibility I felt was enormous because I was in that room the, the advocate for the move of the embassy. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, confronted by people who clearly uh, outranked me. Uh, whether it was uh, the De Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, or Secretary of State Tillerson, or the, um, the National Security Advisor, General McMaster. I mean, these were people with, you know, years and years and years of experience in the foreign arena. And I'm, you know, about uh, a few months on the job. And um, the way the President structured this is he wanted them to raise their objections, and then I would respond. So. Um, I felt the, this enormous responsibility that the future of Jerusalem was on my shoulders. So that was, that was how I felt. Now, fortunately, I had uh, time to prepare. And over the course of, you know, 35 years in the legal profession, I was a trial lawyer. I didn't, uh, I wasn't, you know, fresh to the notion of making arguments. So, uh, you know, as, as I describe in the book, there were some objections made. But ultimately, what I really think it came down to was, as, as you pointed out, um, what do we do about all these, these potential bad actors? You know, who, for whose benefit would we not move the embassy to Jerusalem? I mean, it, to begin with, there was a law, right? The Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995 that required the move of the embassy, and the president had promised that he would move the embassy. So now, why wouldn't we do it? Would we not do it because we're afraid of the Palestinians? We're afraid of, of rogue actors? We're afraid of people that don't like America? potentially not liking America a little bit more. And what I said to the president was, you know, the world is, is watching right now, and they're going to they're gonna determine from this move what kind of a presidency this is going to be. Is this going to be a traditional presidency where the president simply kind of walk in lockstep with the wooden ideology of the past, or whether you're really the non-politician, the truth teller that, that you ran on? And it's going to resonate in Iran. It's going to resonate in North Korea. It's going to resonate in... Russia, it's going to resonate in all the places where people are wondering whether they can test the United States and whether the United States will cower in the face of that test because it's afraid. And, uh, and I think he understood that intuitively, how important it was. It was also, of course, enormously important for Israel. 
but it had ramifications that went throughout the world. It was a monumental decision and, uh, and the events afterwards, which no one could have predicted, proved that you were right. There was no uh, World War III. The Arab Street did not go into a rage. In fact, the silence was almost eerie afterwards. And I, and I think it proved the thesis very much that it was time to break with the foreign policy elites and mm -hmm. all of the, the previous thinking of, of previous administrations. Well, you know, and on that point, you know, um, it's not that we were lucky and there was no, um, no violence. We, we spent weeks assessing the, uh, you know, the, the risks of, of doing this. And what, um, what I would find from people that were uh, objecting is that, um, you know, they would say, well, there's going to be, there's going to be violence. And I would say, well, how do you know that? And they said, well, because people are going to be upset. And I said, okay, I get that. People are going to be upset. What is the, um, what is the real intel that you have that will convince, you know, a decision maker that there's going to be violence, you know? Uh, I get it. You don't. You don't need. We don't need all you brilliant analysts to determine that people might be upset by a decision. That's probably true of almost any controversial decision. The question is, will being upset lead to violence? And there was nothing but speculation out there that it might lead to violence. And uh, the more I studied it, the more I was convinced that um, we could achieve this in a peaceful way. And, and again, uh, the events afterwards proved that, in fact, uh, it was peaceful and, and there was no breakout of World War III following sure. the decision. Ambassador Friedman, you mentioned earlier that you've known President Trump for many years now. And in, in your book, Sledgehammer, you give us some insight into the man. But what do you think our audience should know about President Trump? You describe in the book his relationship with his children. What, what can you tell us about Donald Trump, the man, that you don't think people know when they view him on television or elsewhere? Well, look, I, you know, he, he, he loves his kids and he's a good father. That was sort of the, 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 the takeaway that I got from knowing him and, and his family. You know, he wants his kids around. He works with his kids, trusts his kids. They trust him. They, uh, they're, um, uh, they're very loyal to their father. He's very loyal to them. So. Um, you know, when, when, I, when I grade people, you know, one of, the, one of the most important factors is how they deal with their, their family, with their children. So, so he's a good father, and that, that means a lot, uh, meant a lot to me. Um, he's, uh, you know, he, he is extraordinarily transparent. So, like, whatever you see on TV, you know, that's the way he is. He's just like that, you know, when he's not on TV. He's, he's exactly, it's exactly what you see is what you get. So some people say, well, you know, I like what I see, that's great. And I say, terrific, then that's exactly who he is. Some people say, well, we don't like what we see. Uh, and I say, well, okay, but at least um, it's, it's honest and transparent. How many people do you see that are, uh, that are on television there, you know, they, they couldn't be nicer, they couldn't be more polite, they couldn't be more respectful, but when the camera turns off, they become, you know, uh, you know horrible, right? It happens all the time, and we all know those, we all know those people, people like that. And so... You know, I think it's refreshing to have somebody who, uh, who is exactly the way, he the way he portrays himself is exactly who he is. Ambassador, can I ask you what your relationship is with President Trump today? It's good. I was just with him um, uh, about two weeks ago. I went to visit him, just him and me. Uh, I went into his uh, office in Mar-a-Lago. We sat and chatted for about 90 minutes, and, and we have a good relationship. Um, and I... And I uh, I hope we'll continue to see him uh, in politics. I think he has, uh, you know, I think that what he accomplished in four years in terms of the economy, national security, uh, diplomacy, um, uh, homeland security, uh, I don't think anybody has done that in eight years, what he did in four years. Um, so um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of having served in, in his administration. and. I think of the American people you know, should be very grateful for the service that, uh, that he gave to our country. I couldn't agree with you more, and it was a privilege and honor for me to serve in the Trump administration as well. I wanted to bring us now to um, another item you mentioned in your book, which is the fact that during the four years when you were ambassador and the administration was in office, we had quiet in Israel. You attribute that to the Trump administration signaling loud and clear that Israel can do what it needs for her own defense. 
What is your take on events since we left office uh, and specifically the May conflict between Israel and Hamas? So the, um, so yeah, that, that, that to me is a critical point in terms of keeping not just the, uh, not just Israel safe, but be keep, keeping all of our allies safe. We have to make it clear that um, when it comes to our allies, um, we respect their decision on how to best defend themselves. No, it's not America's job to defend Israel, and it's also not America's job to tell Israel how to defend itself. And um, I think everybody understood that um, if, if there was an attack on Israel, God forbid, and, and of course there were in, uh, in, in last summer, if there were, that you know, Israel's job would be to protect its citizens and to end the war as, as quickly as possible. Um, that's a very important message to send. And, it, and as you said, it kept the region very quiet. So they tested Biden, you know, as soon as he came in. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly happy with the way, you know, he, he responded. Um, there, there, was, there was an over, the, the, the public messaging was, was better than the private messaging. The private messaging was, you know, you got to end this. And there was a lot of pressure put on Israel. I didn't realize it at the time. I just learned it afterwards. But there was a lot of pressure put on Israel to end the war. And, um, and Israel, look, Israel's going to end the war itself. You know, the, 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 the crazy part about this is it somehow, um, it somehow, somehow presupposes that Israel um, can't, on its own, make its own decisions and discharge its own interests. But for the United States to put its thumb on the scale, even a little bit, begins to... Um, change the calculus of Israel's enemies. And so I, I thought that was a mistake. Well, speaking of Israel's enemies, um, we spoke earlier about the Abraham Accords. Um, I think the Accords and the lead up to it, the Vision for Peace uh, plan, broke every foreign policy rule, if I may say, and, and, and you know, blew minds in Washington, D.C. Tell me what you think you attribute the success of your own and the Trump administration's brokering of these peace deals between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, followed by Morocco, Sudan, Kosovo. So the, the first step, if you will, was to be able to demonstrate that Israel was willing to make peace. Because the, the, the story on Israel is that it doesn't want to make peace. Well, that's ridiculous. The, the Israelis have wanted peace and nothing but peace since the day they came into existence in 1948. So um, what we tried to do was to construct a, a vision for peace that, for the first time in history, showed the territorial dimensions upon which Israel was willing to live with, with its Palestinian neighbors. Um, it broke the molds in a lot of different ways. It broke the molds, first of all, in, in making it clear that the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria would be there forever. Look, the Israelis have unilaterally, or depending on, they've, they've both unilaterally in the case of Gaza or with, uh, in, in conjunction with the peace treaty with Egypt, they've withdrawn from probably 87 or 88 percent of the land they captured in 1967. You know, so, you know, it's not like Israel has been stubbornly holding on to land just for the sake of holding on to land. They've held on to land where it's been, number one, essential to their security, and number two, where the land represents the biblical history of the Jewish people, that, uh, that no Jewish state should be, accepted to, should be expected to relinquish. So, but, the, but the vision for peace had, had the territorial dimensions, which were new, okay, which gave the Palestinians a significant amount of incremental territory. Now, would they have a state in a traditional sense? No, they wouldn't. But by the way, that was the, that was the vision of Yitzhak Rabin, not just the vision of Donald Trump. I mean, the, Yitzhak Rabin was the... Uh, you know, it was, it's considered by the left to be the, he gave his life for the cause of peace. He also didn't see the Palestinians having an actual state where they controlled their borders and their airspace and their electromagnetic spectrum. It's much, much too risky. So we, we put, you know, a number of things on the table. We also said, look, to the Palestinians, look, the United States should never be putting its imprimatur on a, on a state that has no system of justice, that pulls people out of, the, out of their home in the middle of the night, and arrests them that has no freedom of speech, no freedom of religion. That's the state they want to create. Is that what the Middle East needs? Another state like that? So, so you know, we, we wrote a plan that actually made sense. And that was step one. And then, um, uh, in demonstrating Israel's willingness to make peace on highly 
rational terms, and I think favorable terms, to the Palestinians, um, some of the neighbors you know, took notice. They read the plan. The Saudis uh, gave a real endorsement of the plan. Uh, at the rollout of the plan, we had the ambassadors from Oman and Bahrain and UAE. And, you know, uh, some of the European countries you mentioned uh, endorsed the plan. And so all of a sudden we have a, a process where, um, where Israel is now perceived as a peacemaker and the Palestinians, because they're ripping it up at the Security Council, are being viewed as being, you know, recalcitrant. And that kind of opened people's eyes to what really was going on. And that was how it began. And what about the Israel's Arab neighbors? The ones who, the peacemakers, the Emiratis, so incredibly brave to be the first, the Bahrainis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, was, what was it like working with them as they were trying to get to the place where they could have warm peace deals with Israel? Oh, I thought, I thought they were all just outstanding people. As you said, very courageous. You know, people don't understand that, um, you know, the, the, the threat profile of these countries changed, you know, changed when they made these decisions. But I think that, you know, they were looking, uh, they were looking at the region and they were thinking, what is best for our own people? That, that's exactly the problem with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The leadership is not looking at what's best for their people. They're looking at what's best to entrench themselves and to uh, enrich themselves. Um, not the case here. So, um, yeah, the conversations were, were incredible. And they, and, and they took, uh, you know, weeks, not months, weeks to really work all this stuff out. Um, and, it, and it was all driven by the fact that they were now in a position to say to themselves, to their people, and to the Palestinian people, look guys, you know, the world's moving. You know, the world moves on. We all have to act for the interests of our own people. And while we, we want to help you to achieve, uh, uh, you know, your aspirations, um, not at the expense of our own people. You know, that, those days are over. And so, and you remember, of course, the, uh, the famous speech by John Kerry when he was Secretary of State. He said it was absolutely, fundamentally inconceivable and impossible for Israel to make peace with its Arab neighbors without solving the Palestinian conflict. And we knew from day one, from 2017, that was wrong. And, uh, and it was always in our minds that that was something that we could achieve in the first term. So, Ambassador, looking forward, and, and you're, you're asking my question by saying that, mm -hmm. you have, I think, beyond uh, belief proven your statesmanship, and you just shared that you hope that we have a chance in 2024, another opportunity mm -hmm. to get back in and bring peace to the Middle East. How, how do you envision doing that? What's most, I think, uh, impressive about the Abraham Accords is that they were achieved uh, in the aftermath of unprecedented support for Israel. Right? The conventional wisdom is that if you want to make peace with the Arab world, you have to beat up on Israel. You have to somehow diminish Israel's standing. Uh, just the opposite is true. By standing so strongly with Israel, we demonstrated how the U.S. treats an ally in the Middle East. And that, that, that image resonated with all the other allies, they said, well, we want to have a relationship with the United States the way Israel has a relationship. The United States seems to treat its allies very well in this region. We want to be like Israel. And so um, the, the, the real takeaway from all of this is that contrary to, and again, it goes back to the whole point of the sledgehammer, contrary to all the conventional wisdom, standing strongly with Israel on all of its issues is, is, is the surest path to peace, and, and we, will, we will, as I said, I think we will end the Arab-Israeli conflict um, if we have another few years to engage in this part of the world. Well, amen to that. And uh, Ambassador David Freeman, this was an incredible conversation. Um, your book, Sledgehammer, uh, great book. I truly, I couldn't put it down from, from start to end. So eloquent, so well written. Thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thank you, Ellie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.